My message is simply this, things that you really need to know. Things that you really need to know. Sometimes in life, ignorance is bliss. But that is not always true when it comes to things which are eternal. I'm going to read a familiar passage of Scripture. You know it well. But this is the Word of God, and uh, let us not be over-familiar with it. It's John chapter 14. You know it. You've heard it. You maybe have memorized it. Verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And we thank God for his word. Father, in the quietness of these moments, we pause in your presence. We thank you for the messages and song that have been brought to us already this evening from Brian and Ruth. And as we turn to your word, we pray for the gracious help of the Holy Spirit. Speak to me, Lord. Speak through me. And grant, Lord, that tonight, above and beyond everything else, we will hear your voice through your word and respond to it in a way that shall be for our good and, above all, for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Speech is a wonderful thing. Sometimes, however, it seems to be used to confuse things rather than make them clear. Sportsmen and sports commentators are renowned for their ability to confuse. One legendary motor racing commentator is famous in this area, and here are a few of his best examples when he was in full flow. Commenting on a Formula One race, he says, either that car is stationary or it's moving. And then he says the leading car is absolutely unique except for the one behind it, which is identical. And others weren't too far behind in their uncanny ability to twist language. One sportsman said, I owe a lot to my parents, especially my mother and father. And the winning jockey was once asked to describe a race course, and he said it was as flat as a billiard ball. John Motson is a very famous football commentator, and in the days when not everybody had color televisions, he was commenting, commenting on a match that was taking place, and he says, for you who are watching this match in black and white, the team on the left is playing in yellow. That's a good one, isn't it? And then one champion boxer once said, sure there have been injuries and death in boxing, but none too serious. And we can smile, and we can try to manage out what these various speakers meant to say. But isn't it good to listen to someone who says what they mean and means what they say? And that's the wonderful thing about the Bible, the Word of God. For in the Word of God, we read what God has said, and we discover that He means what He says. In our Bible reading this evening, the Lord Jesus is on His way to the cross. The disciples were fearful because of their future. And Thomas the doubter asked the question, how can we know the way? It's a wonderful question. How can we begin the day and end the day knowing the way? And our Savior makes this confident declaration, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. These words have been referred to as the alphabet of salvation. They provide for us a complete and concise summary of the gospel, the good news. And they address our three greatest needs in life. 
We all need direction. We all need certainty. And we all need hope. We all need direction, certainty, and hope as we try to negotiate our way through life and plot our course through a world of disappointments, heartaches, pain, and tears. And these words of the Savior in John 14 form the basis of God's answer to the big questions about life, death, and eternity. I want to try and unpack them this evening very simply and explore with you and amplify their meaning. And hopefully, as we do so, we will not fail to be impressed by their simplicity and by their accuracy. The message that uh, Jesus brings to the hearts of his disciples, to our hearts and minds, is all about himself. The Bible is all about Jesus. In the Old Testament, he is promised. In the New Testament, he is revealed. In the Acts of the Apostles, he is preached. In the Epistles, he is explained. And in the book of the Revelation, he is anticipated. The Bible is all about Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the one who refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega the one who is the alphabet out of which God frames every sentence, every paragraph, and every chapter in the story that is called salvation. And as we listen to the words of the Lord Jesus in response to Thomas's question, what can we learn? Well, there are three simple things that I want to lift from this text this evening, which God wants you and I to learn. And the first is this, that in a world without direction, Jesus is the way. In a world without direction, Jesus is the way. Our Lord reminds Thomas and all of us of a truth that we must never ignore, and it's this, that he, that is the Lord Jesus, is the only way to God. He is the only way to his Father's house. He is not one way among many ways. He is the only way. The one and only way to God is through Jesus Christ, His Son. And we can see and sense that Jesus says this without any hint of apology or any fear of contradiction. On the outskirts of London, there stands the impressive Hampton Court, built in the days of Henry VIII. And one of the most famous hedges in the world is located within the grounds of Hampton Court. This maze covers a third of an acre and contains half a mile of paths. It's incredibly easy to get lost. And people flock to it from all over the world, and each year thousands of them are happy to be lost in it. And when they cannot find their way out, an attendant will come to their aid, and he will ask the question, Are you lost? And the response he waits for is, yes, I'm lost. And then he will say to them, well, then, if you're lost, follow me. The Bible teaches us, and human experience confirms it, that a massive barrier exists between God and man. And that barrier is sin. Someone has said, sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you further than you want to go. And sin will lead you where you do not want to stay. But God, in His great mercy, God, in His plan of salvation, has removed sin through the death of His Son, the Lord Jesus, on the cross, and opened for all who believe a way back to God. And the fact that Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross is the ultimate proof that there is no other way. The Apostle Paul reminds his readers in Galatians 2 and verse 21 that of righteousness were through the law, then Christ died in vain. That Christ died for no purpose. That Christ died for nothing. It was a waste of time for Jesus to die on the cross if man had the capacity to save himself. You see, there are those who will say, well, every night before I go to bed, I say the Lord's Prayer, and every day I try to keep 
the Ten Commandments. I do my best, and I hope that at the end of the day, I have done enough to justify myself a place in heaven. That is absolutely contrary to the whole teaching of the Bible with regard to the gospel. Before we left uh, Kilkeel in 1984, it was November, the Sunday School Parents' Night was brought forward a week or two so that we could be part of it. And it took place across the way in the building. And the late George Hall, of course, was the superintendent, and he was responsible, along with his wife, for many items that took place that evening, singing and all the rest of it, and then there was the prize distribution. Gareth was only a young boy at the time, and he had to learn a poem. And we got a video of that evening, and uh, included in that evening also was a video of our farewell. And every Christmas that video is played at our home, of course, with a full uh, audience in the home, and uh, Gareth is always there. And our family said, uh, turn on the video. And this little boy climbs up the steps to the pulpit uh, in the old church building. He's always quick to uh, remind his nephews and nieces he didn't have a piece of paper in front of him the way some have today. In those days, you had to learn it, and you had to recite it from memory. And it went something like this. It was evening, and bedtime was coming. The grown-ups had finished their tea. And two little boys in pajamas were sitting on grandfather's knee. Oh, Granda, who is the tallest? Asked Peter as he snuggled down. I'm the tallest by far, aren't I, Grandad? No, I am, said John with a frown. I'll measure you up, chuckled Grandad, and stationed them both by the door. Tall Peter, who soon will be seven, and stout little John, who was four. He carefully marked off the inches, and Peter, he shouted with glee. Now, wait a minute, said Granda. We're forgotten to measure up me. So crying and quarreling forgotten, they measured him up on the wall, and two little marks far below him now somehow seemed ever so small. When you measure yourself beside others, you feel oh so big and so grand that very few people, if any, can hope to arrive where you stand. But measure yourself against Jesus, and then you will feel oh so small. Your goodness, your kindness, your merit, now somehow don't help you at all. And yet he has said if we trust him and ask for his grace that he has given, we may every day grow more like him and one day be with him in heaven. I haven't memorized that. I'm at the stage where I can get up and know what time of day is. That's enough to remember. But the truth has never changed from all those years. And there are people in the world tonight, and they think they're all right for heaven. And the reason why they think they're all right for heaven is because they measure their goodness against someone else's goodness, and they feel that because they maybe consider themselves to be better than them, they have a better chance of getting into heaven. But the little poem reminds us that we don't measure ourselves against others. We measure ourselves against God and against His Son, Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we feel so miserable. And so you see, in a world without direction, Jesus alone is the way. I remember as a young boy, I learned a verse I've never forgotten. The verse of a hymn, I take him at his word indeed. Christ died for sinners, this I read, for in my heart I find a need of him to be my Savior. In a world without direction, he is the way. In a world without certainty, he is the truth. In a world without certainty, he is the truth. 2,000 years ago, Pilate asked the question, what is truth? Politically speaking, we live in an age of spin. Where do we go to find the truth in the political world? Uh, people are being economical with the truth. Our generation cannot always claim that the camera never lies. Because of modern technology, that may not necessarily be the case. Where can we find the truth? 
Well, the Bible tells us that the devil is the father of lies. And from the beginning, Satan has sought to undermine the truth. Do you remember he came to our parents in the Garden of Eden? And he said to them, Hath God said? God had given instruction regarding the tree that they might eat of and the tree that they could not eat of. And Satan comes in Genesis 3 and 1. He says, Hath God said? Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? He is the father of lies. Lies is his native language. We read of his lies at the beginning of the Bible, and we learn at the end of the Bible what will happen to all liars, their portion, along with the cardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And we live in a world that people say, there's no such a thing as truth. There's no such a thing as absolute truth. What is truth to you may not be truth to me. What is truth to her may not be truth to him. What is truth to them may not be truth to us. And so you find your own level of truth. And truth differs according to the individual, according to their assessment, according to their understanding. And we live in a confused world. Where do we go to find truth? You see, once you lose all, absolute objective truth, which is in God alone, you are left to perish in a jungle where truth is determined by popular opinion and individual choice. And fallen man is trapped in this great delusion that you cannot really know the truth. You can't be sure of heaven before you die. You can't be really sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can't be really sure that the Bible is the revealed Word of God. You see, man is dead in trespasses and in sin, and he's unable to hear the truth until someone removes the earmuffs from his ears so that they might hear. He's unable to see the truth because he's blinded by the God of this world. He's unable to understand the truth until God opens his mind. So why is it so important to speak the truth? Because truth comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. Why speak the truth? You see, the Spirit of God creates the capacity to hear the Word of God through the Word. Truth flows from God, found in Christ, who alone is able to say, I am the truth. And Satan, from the very beginning, was out to take truth out of circulation. He is out to keep the truth from the people and the people from the truth. And it's Jesus who says in John 8, You shall do the truth and the truth shall make, set you free. Jesus says, I am the truth. He is the eternal God who cannot lie. The eternal Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, who will always guide us in the truth. The eternal Son tells us that He is the truth. Jesus tells us the truth about God, the truth about Himself, the truth about you and me, the truth about all men. Jesus tells us that God is holy, that man is sinful, and Christ is needful. Every Lord's Day is an Easter day. Did you know that? It is the first day of the week. And what happened on the first day of the week was that the stone was rolled away, not to let Jesus out, but to let the inquirers in to hear the angelic announcement. He is not here. He is risen from the dead. And tonight, Jesus Christ is alive and well and has conquered sin and death and the grave. And our great Creator God, who made us for Himself, loves us in spite of our sinful ways and longs that we may experience that love through receiving His forgiveness for all our sins. He wants us to know the truth. He wants us to know the truth that we cannot save ourselves that we are fallen and feeble, that we have failed to meet God's righteous requirements because of sin, that we need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. He is the one who comes to fallen man in his misery and need. 
He is the Son of God who gave His sinless life for our sinful lives that we might be forgiven and made fit for God's heavenly home. There are things that you really need to know tonight. You need to know that in a world without direction, He that is the Lord Jesus is the way. You need to know that in a world without certainty, He that is the Lord Jesus is the truth. And thirdly, you need to know in a world without hope, He is the life. Maybe this evening, deep within your heart, there is a sense of the need of hope. There's a yearning for something better. We all have a sense for the need of hope. It has been said that man can live 40 days without food, eight days without water, a minute without air, but only a few seconds without hope. We all need hope. But where do we find it? Many tonight live in a world of shattered dreams with unfulfilled hope. Where do we find hope in the midst of despair? Where do we find hope in the midst of distress? Where do we find hope in the midst of disappointments? Where do we find hope when we feel like packing it in and running away? Where do we find hope when we're struggling with pain and sorrow, illness and grief? Where do we find hope when we're fearing the worst, when we feel rejected by family and friends? Where do we find hope when we say goodbye to those whom we have loved for so long. Well, here is how the Bible defines and spells hope. J-E-S-U-S. He is the hope that brings peace and joy and a sense of purpose in this life and the passport to heaven for all eternity. He is the hope that outlasts every hope and outshines every other hope. And the good news of the gospel can be summed up in three words. He is able. God is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto him through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In a world without direction, he is the way. In a world without certainty, he is the truth. In a world without hope, he is the life. Three things characterize our world system tonight. Humanism, materialism, perversion. Atheistic humanism, where man is placed above everything else. Man is the measure and end of all things. Each man is his own boss, his own standard of good, and his own source of authority. In a word, man is his own God. That's the world in which we live. Not only atheistic humanism, but empty materialism. Materialism places high value in physical things, in money, because money is a means of acquiring other things. I want more has been the cry of the ages. If only I had more. The American millionaire Rockefeller was once asked, how much money does a man need to make him happy? And he replied, just a little more. It's been said money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy companionship, but not friends, entertainment, but not happiness. Money can buy food, but not an appetite, a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy a crucifix, but not a savior. Money can buy the good life, but not eternal life. And the Beatles were right. Money can't buy me love. We live in a world of atheistic humanism. We live in a world of empty materialism. We live in a world of sexual perversion, the giant that dominates modern Western society, along with humanistic appeal to self-interest and the materialistic appeal to self-aggrandizement, is sexual vice used to persuade and promote self-pleasure. This is the spirit of the age in which we live. This is the course of this world that opposes everything that is righteous, Christ-centered, and God-glorifying. And you and I need to know these things tonight. And maybe tonight you need to appropriate them to your heart and life in a way in which you've never done before. You need to hear God speaking into your heart, into your situation tonight. 
You need to hear the voice of God through the Word of God. And you need to come to that place tonight where you realize that in a world without direction, Jesus is the way. And in a world without certainty, Jesus is the truth. And in a world without hope, Jesus is the life. The little chorus puts it like this. Without the way, there's no going. Without the truth, there's no knowing. Without the life, there's no growing. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Let's pray. Father, we pray that the Spirit of God might use the Word of God tonight to speak to all our hearts. We pray that we will be on the way and not in the way. We pray that we will not know the truth just in our minds, but that truth will affect our hearts and permeate our lives. We pray tonight that we will live in an uncertain world with this growing and glowing hope that Jesus Christ is our Savior, our friend, our counselor, our guide. We pray that none will leave this service tonight without praising God for the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're turning to 400.